1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look today at a subject related to the last days, the day of the Lord. And I'm going to give a lot of detail as I go through this with you, so hopefully you're ready to receive a Bible study out of this passage. Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 11, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And so last week we were looking at the subject of the rapture. And I pointed out that the rapture occurs before what is called the seven year tribulation. Now, the tribulation is a period of time that God will pour out his wrath on earth. He's poured out his wrath on unbelievers. And as you go through scripture, you'll see that this period called the tribulation that we refer to as the tribulation is is also known uh, with various other titles or, or, uh, or names, if you will. The tribulation is also known as the day of the Lord. You see that in Joel 1.15, as well as Isaiah 13, verses 6 through 9. Paul here in verse 2 of chapter 5 mentioned it in that way. You see that the tribulation is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, or the day of trouble, Daniel 12, verse 1, Zephaniah 1, verse 15, and it's also referred to as the Great Tribulation, which speaks of the second half of the seven-year period. And Jesus made reference to that when he spoke of it in Matthew 24, verse 21. Somebody said concerning the Tribulation, he said that the Tribulation is a future seven-year period of time when God will finish His dis discipline of Israel and finalize His judgment of the unbelieving world. The church made up of all who have trusted in Jesus to save them from being punished for sin, will not be present because the church will be removed from the earth in the rapture. Now, Paul had already made that clear. He made it clear that the church is saved from the wrath to come. The tribulation period is most clearly revealed for us in Revelation chapters 6 through 19. And so with this in mind, we know that the church is not going through this period of judgment because, as mentioned earlier, Christians have not been appointed to wrath. When you look at your Bible, you'll see that in times of judgment, God has delivered the righteous while he judges the unrighteous. For example, when he brought the flood, he delivered Noah and his family from that judgment. Genesis tells us in chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, that God determined to judge wicked mankind, but Noah had found grace in the sight of the Lord. When God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham began to question God concerning this judgment that was to come, because when he was told of the coming judgment, he asked the question, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Genesis 18, 23. The answer was no. So Abraham's nephew Lot and Lot's daughters were delivered even though those cities were judged. You see, the tribulation is a period when God pours out his wrath on unbelievers. Christians will not experience this wrath. We've been delivered from it. And Paul's been saying that in 1 Thessalonians. Remember in chapter 1, verse 10, how that verse says the Thessalonians were waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, we'll see that God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. When you read in Revelation chapter 6 concerning the tribulation, verses 16 and 17 describe the tribulation as the great day of His wrath. And it speaks how they, they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come and who is able to stand? And so, at this time, the church has been going through afflictions as well as persecution. Paul has already spoken of their afflictions and their response to them. He had said in chapter 1, verse 6, that they were enduring affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. But he was concerned for their faith. He wanted their faith strengthened. And that's why in chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, that's why he sent Timothy. Now, they were suffering. They were afraid that they might be in the tribulation. And because the Thessalonians were confused, Paul now begins to explain this to them. And that's what he's doing in chapter 5, verse 1, when he says, Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. So he speaks of the times and seasons. Time speaks of the, the uh, uh, amount of time that passes until all things will be fulfilled. Seasons speak of the events that occur as believers are awaiting the end of all things. And times and seasons often speak of the way time is experienced. So when he speaks of the times, five minutes with somebody you love is short, but five minutes underwater is eternity. So he's speaking concerning how they experience that and experience the time as they're waiting. And waiting for the rapture could produce anxiety because it seems like it's taking too long. And so he says in verse 1, you know the conditions that will exist prior to the rapture of the church. And because you do, you should be in the state of anticipation and not in anxiety. Notice how he says in verse 2, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. That word perfectly, when he says you yourselves know perfectly, is a word that, that can be translated completely or accurately. You have a perfect or an accurate knowledge of these things. Now, how could he say this kind of thing to them, that they have this accurate knowledge? How could he say that with confidence? Well, we need to remember that he had spent time instructing them concerning the basic fe uh, features and events that were about to take place or that would take place in the future. Sometimes when you read your Bible, you'll note that how when Paul went to their, uh, to their city, it's recorded in Acts 17, in verses 1 through 9, it, it makes it clear that he was there and the church was planted. And it records that Paul had reasoned in the synagogue for three Sabbaths. So it could seem that he spent only a short time there, maybe two or three weeks at the most. But that's more than likely not the case. Because when you begin to see other scriptures as it pertains to this, Paul mentions that he received financial support on two occasions from a city called Philippi. And in Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, he said, You Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Now that tells us something, because Philippi was a hundred miles from Thessalonica. It would have taken some time for them to be able to send not only once, but a second time support and all. So he was more than likely there longer. And he was there long enough to thoroughly teach them. And what they had been taught should bring comfort to them. And that's the point he's making. You don't need to be afraid. So he says in verse 2, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. He would have taught them about the day of the Lord as he was teaching them Old Testament truth. Because the Old Testament reveals and explains what the day of the Lord is. The day of the Lord is an extended period of time when the Lord deals with his enemies. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is referred to around 20 times. It is a time that God pours out judgment, distress, and wrath on unbelievers during the tribulation. Isaiah 13, 9 through 11 says it like this. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. 
For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Ezekiel 30 verse 3 says, The day of the Lord is near, a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Joel 2 verse 2 says, It is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Joel 2.31 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke of this as he was teaching. In Matthew 24.29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. John wrote concerning this in the book of Revelation. I already mentioned Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17. It is a day of great wrath, and who is able to stand? And so that's what Paul is speaking about here. And he says, you know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Now, I want to note something with you. Look in verse 2 with me. He said, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. But notice verse 3, how he goes on to say, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So he's distinguishing two classes of people here. He's distinct, distinguishing between the believer and the unbeliever. He had just said they knew perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief, in other words, believers will be prepared, but the non-believers are the ones who are taken by surprise. He says in verse 2 that it will come as a, as a thief in the night. It's going to come suddenly. It'll come by surprise to those who are not expecting Jesus to return. Paul had taught them what the Old Testament said and, and what Jesus taught about this because Jesus gave ample warning to those who would hear what he had to say. In Luke 12, 39 and 40, he said it like this. Jesus said, understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. In other words, he may come at any time. So you need to be prepared. And Jesus made it clear that a period of time would pass until that day came. It would be a prolonged time. And so they were to be in a state of readiness at all times. In Mark 13, 33 through 37, he said it like this. He said, take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house, gave authority to his servants and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore... For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And so he says, you know perfectly, you have been taught, is the point that he's making. You know these things because you've been prepared but he mentions the fact in verse 3 that they're going to be saying peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And so he's making it very clear that somebody is saying peace and safety. Now I've already mentioned to you how Paul uses the words they and them. And so we have to ask ourselves who he's referring to. We know that he's referring to believers and unbelievers, but who is he specifically referring to? when he speaks concerning them saying, or when they say peace and safety. At that point, we know he's referring to false prophets who are preaching a false peace during the tribulation. You see, after the rapture, people will come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. There'll be many who are martyred. In Matthew 24, 9 and 10, Jesus said, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended will betray one another, and will hate one another. Well, tribulation saints will be warning the world that peace only comes through Jesus. The world will be in a false peace because the world will follow after Antichrist. False prophets will deceive the world into a false inward peace and outward security. 
False prophets will abound. They will gain prominence. They will deceive. Jesus in Matthew 24, 11 said, Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. These are part of the false religious system referred to in Revelation 17 as Mystery Babylon. There's going to be a lot of tension. And a leader that can bring peace is going to be welcomed by all. False prophets will establish an accepting atmosphere for Antichrist. Jesus in Matthew 24, 24 said, False Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The Antichrist will be presented as a deeply spiritual but extremely powerful world leader. His false prophets will be successful in convincing the world that he's the one to be followed. Paul to the, the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 said it like this. He said, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Man of sin and son of perdition are also titles of Antichrist. Now, this is still future, but the world is being prepared for Antichrist even as I speak. In our own nation, People are being misled, but they don't seem to even be aware of it or even to care. It's that old picture of the frog in the kettle. You can get a frog and you can put him in a kettle with water. And it'll, if you can keep him in there, he'll just, he'll just sit there in the water. And then you'll turn on the stove. And as you turn the stove on, the water begins to slowly warm up. And the frog never leaves. And it gets to the point where the water boils and the frog remains because it cannot tell the temperature around it. And ultimately, that frog in the kettle will boil to death. And it seems to me that there are many today like the frog in the kettle. They're, they're, they're there not noticing what's taking place around them. It seems that they don't even care. You can see this with what's taking place in the world right now. For example, take Islam. There are those today who minimize the power of Islam's message as it relates to Jews and Christians. More than one Muslim cleric refers to Jews as descendants of apes and pigs. And many call for the destruction of Israel, the United States, as well as Britain. And Islam has those in it that, that are, are purveyors of violent rhetoric. And this violent rhetoric is a fuel for radicals. Yet people are angered when you point that out. They get angry. You could be on a television program with some of the intellectual elite like The View. <laughs> and you can say something about Islam. And you will get Hoopy Goldberg and others upset. How dare you speak like that about, about Muslims? They're good people. But if you say something about the faith of Vice President Pence, they ridicule you and they make it public. You see, to be a Christian isn't popular. But it is not popular for you to point out the errors that others are involved in. This violent rhetoric of Islam is a fuel for radicals. And it's a, it's a system that thinks that killing us honors God. They believe that. They, they will blow themselves up. They will blow up buses with innocent children. They will, they will kill themselves in, in the most horrendous ways and take other, others with them because of their beliefs. And especially if you're a Christian, they will behead you. They will crucify you. They will bury you alive in the name of Allah. In John 16, verse 2, Jesus said, They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And we are living in those days even as I'm speaking. It is so twisted that the average person cannot believe it. In a time with so much anger, many desire peace and the end of senseless violence. And the desire for peace will continue to increase to become an overwhelming desire. Today in our world, especially here in the United States, the rejection of traditional religious faith is being replaced with Spirituality, I mentioned this before, but people will say, I'm not a Christian, but I'm a spiritual person. But in rejecting the message of Christ, 
The words of Jesus and Paul go unheeded. And in our day, the rejection of Jesus and the Bible for many is simply taken for granted. I can remember when I first got saved in the midst of the, the revolution, the Jesus movement, that, that the older people who would see a young person like myself with my long hair and bare feet and all of that, that, that there was a lot of outrage and, and dislike for us. What, what today is, is commonly accepted and all people have the right to, to express themselves the way that they want, dress like they want, wear the hair like they want, all of that is so acceptable today was not acceptable when I was growing up at all. And you could get attacked, you could get your hair cut off, people would call you names. I, I had long hair and I was, I was driving, I, I got arrested for a, a minor infraction. I was so drunk I smashed my car into a light pole. And um, the police took me, the sheriff in Norwalk took me, put me in Norwalk Sheriff's substation. I still remember this. As I was standing there I had the long hair and one of the officers asked, asked me a question. He said, what are you, a, a girl or a boy? That was very common because I had long hair. So he said that to me, what are you, a girl or a boy? And he and his buddy next to him, and I looked at him, and I said, if you don't know the difference between a girl and a boy by now, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and he didn't like it for some reason. I thought it was rather witty. <laughs> so he sprayed me with mace. You know, there was an anger for long hairs. Songs were sung concerning that. There was somebody, you guys, ancient history, here we go. Here's a little lesson for you. The Bible's old, but so is this. There was a group called Sonny and Cher. Sonny was walking out of a restaurant or something. People laughed at him because he had long hair, and they sang a song. He wrote a song called Laugh at Me because of his hair. Cher sang on one occasion that people might not like you because your hair's too long. And his hair wasn't that long. Today, it would be looked at as not long at all. But you need to understand that we all at that time had very short hair. And so there was an anger for the hippies. So when the hippies grew their hair long, people would mock them and had problems with them. But when they saw hippies with Bibles, they saw us differently. They started saying, you know what? It's a good thing that those long hairs are reading that book because it'll change their life because they're a bunch of dopers and bums. And that's what they would say about us. But that book's a good book. And they even called it the good book. And so there was a respect. There was a respect. And if I carried my Bible someplace, and I, and I did always, when I would walk in with my Bible to, a, to wherever, to a, a, an office, to the doctors, to visit, whatever, I have my Bible always because I was taught you need to read the Word. And I did. That's what we hippies did. We were reading the Word, and it was changing our lives, and there was respect for us because those hippies, at least they're reading the Bible. And we were complimented for doing that by people who didn't read it themselves. But the book was respected. And they said, there were people who would say, well, if they begin to do what it says in that good book, then this world will be a better place. But that's not the way it is today anymore. I grew up in a time when the teacher could actually quote Scripture, would actually have prayer with the children in the classroom. Not today. Because of all books, the Bible is banned. They even want to, some people even want to ban the Bible from school libraries. And we've had school teachers here in our church who've had problems with people in different school districts that they have served in where they'll say, you need to take that book off of your, off of your desk. There's an antagonism towards the Word of God, an antagonism towards the things of God, through the, uh, an antagonism uh, concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they do reject, and there's more rejection, and it continues to grow. So in, in our day, the rejection of Jesus and the Bible is for many simply taken for granted. We have a different culture. I, I saw a picture, I think, that puts it in in perspective very well, uh, a picture of the storming of the beaches of Normandy where the, 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 the young soldiers are running up the beach with their weapons to go and, and to fight, uh, to fight for liberation, to fight for, for freedom, for, to fight for the right kinds of things. And, and, and these 17 and these 18-year-olds are running, carrying their rifles, and many of them died. They're on the beaches, and, and we look at them as war heroes, and they, they died for a cause. And, and, and we see what a 17 and an 18-year-old was capable of doing. My dad was 17 when he went into the military. My dad served in the U.S. Navy. 
My dad served as an, a, a, on the USS Pennsylvania. His, his ship was torpedoed by, a, by a, one of these uh, planes that carried uh, torpedoes and, and came into the bay there in Okinawa, and the USS Pennsylvania was blown up. My father was on that ship. And that they were honored, these men. They were honored. The women who went to work in the factories were honored. And these men were willing to lay their lives down for a cause that they thought was a great cause. And today, you go to college and they have their little safe spaces where people are sitting with their blankets and they're sitting with the puppies and they're crying because somebody disagreed with them or they heard something they couldn't really put up with. That's what's going on today. Not everywhere, but in enough places for us to see that America has been weakened and a huge amount of reason America is weak is because we have said the gospel is not necessary. This book, this Bible, the things of Jesus, well, that's your opinion. You can hold fast to them. But if somebody wants to say his name, he's a male, but he wants to say his name is, is a female name, then what right do you have to tell him he's wrong? And that's where we've gotten. And anybody who stands up and says the emperor has no clothes is looked at as being hateful. Well, during the tribulation, that will be the prevailing attitude. Sin will be the norm. Biblical truth will be increasingly rejected. Anxiety will prevail. The result is going to be hardening of hearts and a great rejection, even a greater rejection of truth. In Matthew 24, 12, Jesus said, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Evil will be even more in the open. No longer will evil be hidden. It will be openly practiced and accepted as normal. In our day, we see that it's already taken place. Even 50 years ago, you wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have had some of the marches that we see taking place today. You wouldn't have seen drag queens going into preschools reading children's stories to children the way that we do today. You wouldn't have seen that kind of thing because that was not acceptable. But evil is even more in the open now than ever before. It'll get even worse. In Philippians 3, 18 and 19, Paul said, For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is unearthly things. Gay pride, their glory is in their shame. And that's what's taken place. We've seen it, but people don't want to hear it because you're a hater when you point that out. Before the rapture and just after it, the desire for world peace will reach its apex. And after the rapture, Antichrist will reveal himself. He will bring a temporary peace to the world. And the peace that he brings will be short-lived. It will occur during the first half of the tribulation. So the question is, how will this take place? How is it that this time of world peace will be made possible? Well, spiritual deception will continue to grow. It will prevail. False teachers will exist prior to the rapture and after the rapture will increase. People will follow deceptions sown by demonic spirits, the originators of all false religion. After the rapture, the rejection of Jesus rules. The Antichrist produces false peace. He's a world ruler. He's feared by all. He'll bring peace in the Middle East. Now part of this will occur by him brokering a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. Daniel 9.27 says, He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So Antichrist will reign. The world will begin to live in temporary peace. In the middle of the tribulation, he will break the covenant that he had made. Matthew 24, 15 tells us that Jesus says, you will see, and he's speaking to those who are alive at that time, the abomination that causes desolation. He's going to put an idol in the holy place. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4 says, he will oppose and will exalt himself 
over every, everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Revelation 13 verses 14 and 15 reveals that those who don't worship the beast's image will be killed. Israel's going to see this. She's going to realize as a nation she's been deceived in the middle of the tribulation. And then the last half, the great tribulation, takes place. Again, notice verse 3. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. This sudden destruction is this unexpected ruin. It can include death. They're going to be caught by surprise. They refuse to heed God's warning. It's going to be like when people rejected Noah, warning them concerning the flood. The people would hear him preaching, and they refused to hear that warning. They ultimately were taken in judgment. Jesus speaks of it in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39. He says, As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It'll be surprising to them. It'll be like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. All of you ladies who have had babies know what he's talking about, labor pains coming upon you. They come in an unexpected moment, and they come in strong, and they're very difficult to deal with. He says it's going to be like that, coming in a moment unexpected because they come that way. But verse 4 says, But you brethren are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of the day. <laughs> we are not of the night nor of darkness. And so he once again differentiates between the two. He differentiates that. We're not in, in, in the darkness. We're not walking in the darkness. We're walking in the light. Those who walk in darkness are walking without the direction that God gives. He says that believers are going to be prepared because they're not in darkness. That would refer to spiritual blindness due to, due to them being unsaved. Uh, somebody speaking concerning darkness and those who are unbelievers says they are born in darkness and are brought up in darkness and willingly walk in it. Their understandings are darkened with respect to the true knowledge of God, the nature of sin, the way of salvation by Jesus, the work of the Spirit upon the soul, and the necessity of it, the scriptures of truth and the mysteries of the gospel. Well, believers, because they have been prepared, will not be taken by surprise and will not enter into judgment. And you know how that happens is that they will have those who are teaching them the truth. They will have true shepherds. They will have real preachers, people who are willing to divide the word of God and, and present it to them. And they're going to be saved during that period. Prior to the rapture, there are, are, are genuine pastors who care about the Word of God and will present the truth of the gospel. After the rapture, there will be people who will see that they were deceived and will come to truth, and they will begin to preach and teach and share, and, and, and that's what real pastors are supposed to do. We, we, once again, we live in a time when, when pastors realize that not everybody wants to hear a Bible study. We know that. The days have come already where people will no longer put up with healthy doctrine. They don't, a lot of people don't want to hear a Bible study. They think it's boring, and their lives are, are not progressing towards the things of the Lord at all because they're so enamored with entertainment and distraction that they don't have a, a desire or a hunger for the things of truth. And so when the pastor presents to them the Word of God, not everybody responds well to it. A lot of people say, well, that's your opinion, especially when they're convicted. They don't want to do the things Scripture says. As a result of that, they find somebody who will say to them what they already believe, and they have itching ears, and they will heap unto themselves teachers who will tell them exactly what they want to know, and they're, they're never changed. And what happens when you go through the whole counsel of God is you actually hear the blessings as well as the warnings. And we need both. We need both in order to grow. 
I mean, I, I really enjoy certain foods. I, I like to eat them, but I know there are other things that I need to eat even if I don't like them as much as I like that ice cream. I know that. I, 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 I can eat ice cream. I enjoy it, but I know it's not going to make me healthy, so I can eat that after I eat something healthy. And my wife makes sure by punishing me that I do that. That's how it works in my life. Allow me to complain. But the bottom line is a genuine teacher will tell you the truth. A genuine teacher will say this is what God's Word says and that's why we need to do that which the Lord speaks. In Matthew 24 verses 42 through 44, Jesus said it like this. He said, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. You know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched not allowed his house to be broken into. We need to be prepared. We are not, he says, of the night, nor are we of darkness, because we have and we live by God's word. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And therefore, verse 6, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. So basically, Christian, he's saying live with expectation. Be on the alert. Be moderate and calm in your way of life. Don't give way to an unconcerned state of mind like unbelievers, blinded by sin. Matthew 26, 41 says it perfectly. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And so we are not to be sleeping, we're to be watching, we're to be awake, we're to be alert, and we're supposed to press on. And so he says in verse 8, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Notice how he says in verse 8 that we are to put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's our responsibility. My job as a pastor is to present the, the counsel of God complete. Your responsibility is to believe it, you're, you're, you're to obey it, and you're supposed to act upon it. That's your responsibility. If you have heard the truth, you have now, the responsibility to respond to it. You have the responsibility of putting on that breastplate. You have the responsibility of putting on that helmet. That breastplate of faith and love is to guard your internal organs. He, he's saying, let righteousness rule your spirit as well as your emotions. That helmet that you put on is the hope of salvation. He's saying, be assured of God's salvation. Do not be deceived by false teachers. For God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. God didn't appoint us to wrath. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Romans 5.9 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? God is bringing judgment on those who reject him. And during this time, the day of the Lord, as this is taking place, we who are in this room who have come to know Christ, should the rapture occur in our lifetime, we will be with the Lord. He had already said in chapter 4, verse 17, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. So we look forward to that, to be with Him. We're aware of the signs. We're aware of the times, the seasons. But we also have this great hope of expectation to be with Him. Why? Because verse 10 says He died for us. Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Whether we are alive when He comes, or die before he does, we are with him because he is our life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
He didn't say, I'm a path to those things. He said, I am those things. I am those things. If you want peace, you want joy, you want love, you want forgiveness, you want the way, the truth, and life, you come to Christ. And so because we have a walk with the Lord, we can comfort one another. We can edify one another, as he says in verse 11. Because we have a re relationship with Christ and we have knowledge of sins that have been forgiven. The most selfish person on earth is the one who goes to heaven alone. God has called us to speak the truth in love, to share with people their need for Jesus Christ. You know, in the midst of all the garbage that we see today taking place, so much hatred and, and so much, so little civility, so many lies, you can lose hope. But you know, my hope is not in man. That doesn't mean that I don't have responsibility to do certain things. I, I take those responsibilities seriously and I, won't, I intend to, to, to be salt and light. I intend to speak openly. I intend to live for Christ. I intend to preach the gospel. I intend to raise my children, grandchildren in the knowledge and nurture of Jesus Christ. That's my intent. I want to put on the breastplate. I want to put on that helmet. That is something I'm supposed to do. But that's something we're all supposed to do. We don't have to be without hope. I'm not without hope. Well, sometimes I'm frustrated. I look out there and I say, how did this happen? How did we get to the point where we're banning plastic straws and, and, and threatening people to go to jail for having a plastic straw? And the same government that is saying they'll put you in jail for up to six months for a plastic straw are the ones that provide you with a plastic syringe so you can go out and, and give yourself some, some opiate. Where did that come from? And where did the craziness of this world come from? How did that happen? Well, maybe when he says that we're supposed to be awake, let us not sleep as others do, let us watch me sober, maybe we went to sleep. Maybe the church began to think everything's okay, it's no problem, when in fact the enemy doesn't sleep. And the church does. And we allowed one thing after another, one thing after another over time, to simply insidiously creep in and make this the new normal, where we celebrate Sins that people are in bondage to. When we make days, when you march for those things, and you say you have pride in those things. When we have the drag queens reading those stories to our children in nursery school, and nobody is outraged by it because after all, we're supposed to let them do that. When you have people say that you should not call your child by the name, by a gender, boy or girl, let him or her decide what he is. There's something wrong with this world. And Christians just are quiet. No, wake up and speak up. Because somebody's got to. That's what God has called us to do. That's what God is, that's what salt, that's what salt and light is. And guess what? They hated Jesus before they hated you. And they hate you because of Jesus. So, who cares? I don't. Listen, I'll say this. Here we go. I'll close with a word of prayer in a moment. When I got saved, prior to getting saved, I was a hippie. They didn't like us. They hated us. Society hated us. Pointed at us, laughed at us, called us girls, you boys, boys, girl, what are you? They, they, and you know what I did about that? Nothing. Did I cry myself to sleep and, oh, I'm going to cut my hair so they'll like me? I don't care if you don't like me. That was my attitude because I was a hippie. Guess what? I got saved. And now I follow Jesus Christ. Oh, I don't like you. You're a Jesus freak. And my whole bottom line is, so what? So what? He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't care what you think at all. I care what he thinks. And because I care what he thinks, I'll do what he says. And at the end, he will speak to me and he'll say, welcome, come on in. You were faithful. And that's the only thing that matters in this world is to hear him say that. I am telling you, live for Christ. You're never going to be liked on the job. Stop whining and putting your head on your pillow at night holding your binky. That's just a fact. Don't go out and start a fight. Don't be the toughest Christian on the job side. I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying souls matter. 
And the enemy, all he has to do is make you feel unpopular on the job site or in the school or in the neighborhood. And I'm, I'm hurting. Then you can become a snowflake Christian. But I'm not. Because you know what? My God loves me. My wife loves me. My children love me. My grandchildren love me. My family loves me. My church loves me. That's all I need. I don't need the world to love me. He loves me. That's what matters. That's what matters. Keep that in mind. Because the days are dark. We have to wake up and walk in the light.